Joseph had learned to trust the writer of his story because the story that was written for Joseph was infinitely more glorious, fulfilling, satisfying, and significant than anything Joseph could have planned or carried out on his own. God is the perfect story writer. The path that he has prepared for us is infinitely better than any path we could make for ourselves. Do you realize that? You could, on your own, be as successful as this world will allow. You could achieve every level of success. You could be like Billy Graham. But if that was not the path prepared for you, in God's eyes, you are a failure. On the other hand, God's path for your life could be one of obscurity and struggle. And you could live your life impacting one person. And that is a far, infinitely greater life that is an infinitely more important and more significant life than all of the Billy Grahams put together when that wasn't the prepared path of God. Do you see how for God to prepare the path of your life, it doesn't matter if you're cleaning toilets. If that's the prepared path for your life, that is the most glorious life that we could live. Remember the story of Joseph? Remember Joseph? Remember how Joseph, his life took a lot of turns, didn't it? I mean, he was, he goes from being his father's favorite to thrown down a pit to sold as a slave to ruling the household of, of the soldier guy, Potiphar, to uh, accused falsely, thrown in jail again, to run in the jail, to run in Egypt. I mean, that, that story had a lot of twists and turns. But do you remember at the end of the story, Jacob and his brothers, they'd all come down to Egypt and Joseph had saved their lives and everything. They were living down. And then Jacob dies. And after Jacob, the father dies. Remember all the brothers, they come to Joseph and they say, hey, Joseph, right before dad died, he told us that you're supposed to forgive us. I think they made all that up because they were thinking that once dad was dead, Joseph is going to let us have it. So they said, well, jo Jacob, our dad, his dying wish was that you would be nice to us. Remember Joseph's response? Am I in the place of God? In other words, am I in the place to write my own story? I have lived the story that God wrote for me. And that story took me to the pit of a dry well. It took me in bondage to Egypt. It took me into the dungeon. And it took me to the heights of leadership in Egypt. I'm not in the place of God. I'm here to live his story for my life. Joseph had learned to trust the writer of his story because the story that was written for Joseph was infinitely more glorious, fulfilling, satisfying, and significant than anything Joseph could have planned or carried out on his own. This is a hard thing for us to receive, isn't it? I mean, it sounds good. You're all sitting here on church on Sunday morning. You got your church clothes on and everything. And oh, it's, just, it's really easy to nod your head and amen this. But in the nitty gritty of life, when that thing that you've been counting on, that you've been preparing for, that you have spent your money on, spent your time on for three years now, you thought that's what was coming about. And then all of a sudden the doors closed. That's when it's harder, isn't it? That's when trusting the writer of your story is much harder. And let me tell you, you can't trust him then if you didn't trust him on the minor turns that lead up to that. This is what Paul wants to impress upon us. Trust the writer of your story. Now, here's another biblical truth. I want to just bring this in on the coattails here. This is not in your text. And I know we're all 
about expository preaching here, but this is not in the text. We're going to leave the text now. But you're going to see just how perfectly this dovetails with what Paul says here at the end of Ephesians. We need to learn to trust the writer of our story. We also need to learn to trust the designer of our soul. We need to learn to trust the one who has made us as we are because this is the perfect way for us to be made. Now, as you see, that's not coming from the text, but I'm making just a little bit of a jump from this truth to another truth that's found prominently in the scriptures. God made us exactly like he wants us. And just as we must learn to trust the author of our story, we must learn to trust the God who has made us how we are. So the scriptures speak to us of this in places like Psalm 139. For you formed my inward parts. Now inward parts there is literally kidney. That was a Hebrew idiom of saying the deepest emotional part of you. Or in other words, your personality. Do you know God made your personality? God made your personality. And He made it the way He wanted to make it. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Don't you get the, the image there of a, of a weaver weaving together the perfect tapestry in the mother's womb? I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven, there's that image there of the weaver again, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Depths of the earth is just intended to take our mind back to Adam who came from the earth. As Adam came from the depths of the earth, so also we were woven together in our mother's womb, just as God wanted. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Now, Job chapter 10 says, Your hands fashioned and made me. Remember that you made me like clay. You clothed me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and sinews. Jeremiah 1.5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So you ever struggle with how God made you? You ever struggle with something about your personality you wish was different? Something about your physical appearance you wish was different? If you had the power, would you change something about yourself? So it's at this point we need to be careful because this can lead us astray. Because the modern church and the modern society has taken this and perverted it to mean that however you are is how God meant you to be. And whatever perversity is your perversity, whatever sinful personality traits are... God did not make you to have a short temper. God did not create your short temper. God did not create your disloyal heart. God did not create you with same-sex attraction. God did not create you in the wrong body. Right? Now, it's easy to tell the difference here because if, the way, if something about the way you are contradicts Scripture, that's not how God made you. And that's not what we're talking about. If something about your personality or something about your mannerisms or something about you is contrary to Scripture, that's not what God made. That's the fallen you. But that's not what we're talking about. That's not what the psalmist David is talking about. He's talking about him. He's talking about how God made his body. He's talking about how God made his personality. He's talking about a guy, how God formed his thoughts. You ever think, you know, I just wish God had given me a different nose? Or smaller ears? Or God made me taller? Or God made me thinner? Or God made me wider? Or you ever think, I wish God had just made me wittier? or more intelligent, or more athletic, or more fun-loving, or more serious. Right along with the truth that we must trust God as the writer of the perfect story, we also must trust God that He made you perfectly how you should be. I doubt there's anyone in the room that if you had the power would not change one of those non-sinful things about yourself. Am I right? 
So this too is not an easy one. It's not an easy one. But this is trusting the God who chose us, who knew us. Before he formed us in the womb, he knew us. And he said, I have the perfect plan for your life. I have prepared the perfect works for you. I have prepared the perfect body. I have prepared the perfect personality. I have prepared the path of your life. I have written the story of your life. And if you'll trust me, and you will walk in that story, and you will thank me for how I made you, and you will glorify me in how I made you, then you will see that the life that I have made for you is more glorious and more significant and more meaningful than it could ever have been otherwise. Look at Acts chapter 17, verse 26. And He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Where you were born, God, discerned, God decided that before time. God determined where you'd be born. God determined what culture you'd be born in. God determined what time you'd be born. You ever think, like me, God, why did I have to live in this time? I mean, give me any other time. I mean, take away the hairstyles and the crazy fashion and put me in the 1970s, you know? I know that we all can think like that, but God put us in the perfect time. He put us in the perfect culture for the works that He prepared beforehand. Jeremiah 29, verse 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil. Now this is a verse that's regularly taken out of context today and regularly abused today because God speaks these words to His exiled people in exile in Babylon. But, nevertheless, doesn't this show us the heart of God? The heart of God toward His people to say, I have plans for you and they are wonderful plans. They are the best plans that could have been made for you. Romans 12 verses 4 through 6, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us then use them. So even in the body, God has prepared for you the perfect gifting, the perfect place, in, even in His body. This is learning to trust the writer of our story, learning to trust the designer of our soul, the designer of our personality, the designer of us. He is infinitely wise. And if chapter 1 verse 4 through chapter 2 verse 8 says anything to us, it says loud and clear, He has your absolute best in mind. It's impossible to read the truths of chapter 1 verse 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. It's impossible to read those and think maybe God was holding back on me. Maybe if God would come along with this other idea that I have about my life or the way I should look or the way I should act or who I should be, maybe if God would come on board my plans in my life, it would be a little bit better. It's impossible to think that after reading chapter 1 and chapter 2. Look finally at this quote in your notes from George MacDonald. If you're not familiar with George MacDonald, George MacDonald was sort of the literary mentor, you could say, of C.S. Lewis. He was the literary example. He, George MacDonald was the example that C.S. Lewis followed into the literary world. He says this, I would rather be what God chose to make me than the most glorious creature that I could think of. For to have been thought about born in God's thought, and then made by God, is the dearest, grandest, and most precious thing in all thinking. Did you catch what he said? To have been thought about by God, to have been planned by God, to have been prepared by God. McDonald says, what could be more glorious than to live out that thinking, planning, and preparing that the maker of all things has done for us. What difference do you think it would make if 
the truths of chapter 1 and chapter 2 up to this point, what difference do you think it would make if these truths really, really settled onto our soul in such a way that we fully embraced them and fully believed them completely? How do you think that we would view what Paul has to say from this point forth? Do you think when Paul says, for example, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, do you think that that would land on a heart that's a little bit different? If we really believed these are our blessings and privileges in Christ, this is the hope He has laid up for us, this is the perfect life that He has created for me. Now, bond servants, submit to your masters as unto the Lord. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Or what about some of the other things that He has to say like, rejoice always, and again I'll say rejoice. Or, let each of you not look not only to his own interests, but the interests of others. Let each of you consider others more significant than yourselves. Do you think that that would land on a different heart if that heart was fully believing what Paul has just said to us? Or even some of the other teachings of the New Testament. For example, when James says, Consider it joy, my brothers, when you encounter trials of various kinds. Do you think that that would resonate with us in a different way? If this really became internalized and our souls really did believe the God who has prepared such incredible blessings for me. And He did so before I existed. And He has set forth the perfect prepared path for my life. Yes, I can submit. Yes, I can forgive others who have hurt me. Yes, I can obey in these hard ways. Yes, I can do this. Because the God who has given everything for me and who has planned the perfect life for me tells me this is the best for you.